My name is Megan Crumbaker. I'm one of the staff specialists uh, general urinary oncologist at the King Corn Cancer Center at St. Vincent's in Sydney. Um, and I've been asked to talk about what's new in advanced prostate cancer. So I believe you'll be getting another talk about early prostate cancer. So I've really focused primarily on um, uh, locally advanced or mostly uh, metastatic uh, prostate cancer. So prostate cancer treatments have really evolved over the last 10 years. So whereas previously, um, really, it was kind of a sequential treatment. Um, men had surgery and or radiotherapy um, early on, and they were either cured or if they relapsed or had metastatic disease at the outset, they had some androgen deprivation therapy or ADT. They might have gone on to some simple anti-androgens, um, uh, docetaxel. Um, and there was a few other chemotherapies that really didn't um, prove a survival benefit, but some um, palliative benefit. Um, but that was essentially it. It was kind of sequential therapy across just a few um, treatments. Uh, and uh, the outcomes um, definitely could have improved. Um, so in the last five years, really, um, we've had a big evolution in the way we're treating um, prostate cancer. So rather than kind of going one by one through treatments, there's some men that really get combination treatment up front with either chemotherapy or the novel androgen signaling inhibitor such as enzalutamide or abiraterone. Um, or um, we have approvals for enzalutamide or abiraterone later on in the disease course. We've got additional chemotherapy in the form of cabazitaxel, which has a survival benefit. Um, so really the landscape's changing. And now we've got a number of newer agents in um, trials um, coming through that are also being put into the landscape. And that's things like lutetium um, PSMA treatments, um, PARP inhibitors, and immunotherapy to a lesser extent. <clears throat> so, <laughs> some important delineations to make in um, prostate cancer. It's becoming really um, increasingly important to kind of delineate what the extent of the disease is and what the um, how you establish what the extent of the disease is. Um, uh, because particularly around Australia, we've got um, really easy access to um, PSMA PET imaging. Um, but traditionally, um, the clinical trials internationally have still been using conventional imaging, which is a uh, CT and a whole body bone scan. Um, so delineating how much disease they've got can influence the um, treatment and also, but also how did you determine the extent of their disease. Um, within localized disease, um, the risk stratification still include the T and M staging, um, also with the um, uh, level of the PSA and the extent of the biopsy involved. Um, and in the last few years, we've, we've transitioned from using just the Gleason score to using the ISEP grade group, which is really an extrapolation of the Gleason score. But you'll find that a lot of people still use the Gleason score um, rather than the grade group. Um, in metastatic disease, <coughs> as I mentioned, um, PSMA PET imaging um, has really um, gained a lot of popularity in Australia. It's a very sensitive PET scan that's pretty specific for prostate cancer. So PSMA is prostate-specific prostate membrane antigen, and it's a protein, um, a glycoprotein receptor that's expressed on the majority of prostate cancers and particularly high-grade prostate cancers. Um, so that ligand can be bound to um, a radioisotope like gallium-68 um, to provide um, PET imaging that's um, quite sensitive for prostate cancer compared to conventional imaging with the CT or the bone scan. Um, uh, other really important delineations to make um, in treatment, particularly because PBS um, has certain treatments approved for um, different disease states. Um, in metastatic disease, it's important to delineate whether the patient is hormone sensitive, so still responding to androgen deprivation therapy, or if they're castrate resistant, so their um, PSA has started to go up despite castrate levels of testosterone. Um, and that's really important because the drugs like abiraterone and enzalutamide you can access in the castrate resistant setting, but um, PBS will not pay for those in the hormone sensitive setting. Um, also, the delineation between M0 and M1 disease has become more important um, with a few new clinical trials coming through showing some benefit of bringing treatment earlier in the um, disease course, including M0 um, castrate resistant prostate cancer. Um, so those are just some um, really basic definitions that have become a bit more key because of how you treat them um, and differences in what drugs you can access for those disease states. So. Um, 
just a big overview of um, the new treatment paradigms and what's really changed in the last few years. Um, so in, in metastatic prostate cancer um, and locally advanced prostate cancer, treatments are really moving earlier in the disease spectrum. So I showed you that um, uh, diagram that showed that, you know, previously docetaxel was um, really held until quite late in the disease. The patient was castrate resistant, um, so resistant to androgen deprivation therapy. They, their disease was really, you know, growing properly. Their PSA was going up and they were symptomatic. And that's when you really reserve docetaxel for. Um, and that's a paradigm that's really shifted really since um, about 2015. Um, when we got um, the charted study uh, was published, and since then we've also had Stampede published as well, showing that giving docetaxel earlier in the disease state, so in the hormone-sensitive setting, you really can have a huge impact on the overall survival of that patient. And you know, a lot of the patients um, in that study that had um, didn't have docetaxel up front did go on to have it later in the disease course, um, but the benefit really was maximized by having it in the hormone-sensitive setting up front um, for metastatic prostate cancer. Um, we've also had some um, other studies, including um, Stampede and Latitude and Enzymet studies, um, showing that enzalutamide um, and or abiraterone in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting um, can also improve overall survival versus giving the ADT, um, the androgen deprivation therapy, then waiting for castrate resistance and then adding those um, uh, medications in later, so shifting them forward in the disease course. Um, also, um, Novel androgen signaling inhibitors like insulutamide and abiraterone have also, there's been several studies now uh, showing that they can actually um, improve outcomes for M0 castrate resistant prostate cancer. So patients that have a rising PSA, they've had definitive treatment to their prostate um, either with radiation and or um, uh, uh, surgery and um, despite that their PSA is going up but you do conventional imaging with a um, CT and a bone scan and don't find any disease giving them um, escalated treatment um, uh, with um, either enzalutamide, apalutamide, darolutamide um, really has shown um, benefit uh, for their outcomes. Um, so that's uh, another important delineation to make because previously there wasn't really a standard of care for men who are on ADT and resistant to it without measurable disease on their scans. Unfortunately though, um, what we could actually access of these um, uh, treatments in um, uh, uh, Australia for these settings is somewhat limited. So we can get docetaxel for hormone sensitive um, prostate cancer, um, and that's as per the charted study. We unfortunately can't get enzalutamide or abiraterone in the hormone sensitive setting. That's still reserved for castrate resistant disease. Um, and as far as the novel androgen signaling inhibitors for M0 castrate resistant disease, we can get enzalutamide on a compassionate access program, um, but at this point it's still not on. Um, on PBS, um, but hopefully something comes through um, in the near future in that space. <coughs> so some of the emerging strategies that are coming through as well, um, so um, things that are still really in the clinical trial space, um, but are looking promising and, and definitely on our radar, and you might have patients asking about them because they are being marketed and kind of promoted in, in um, a lot of the mainstream media. Are, um, uh, one, genomically driven treatments. Um, so in prostate cancer, those really are the PARP inhibitors. Um, so like Olaparib, Telosoparib, or Rucaparib. Um, and particularly at this point, the benefit appears to be in patients with DNA repair defects, such as BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. Um, and um, Olaparib has been FDA approved recently based on a, a recent publication in the New England Journal of Medicine for castrate resistant prostate cancer. Um, um, so there's been some evidence of some efficacy in the castrate resistance setting and now we're finding that the trials are kind of moving those um, treatments forward and trying to look at combinations to try to expand um, the benefit to beyond men with DNA repair defects. Um, some other emerging strategies that are still in clinical trials are um, PI3 kinase and AKT inhibitors. So um, particularly IPATASERTIB uh, uh, is um, 
an AKT inhibitor that's um, been showing promise in castro-resistant prostate cancer. Um, so in prostate um, cancer, androgen receptor signaling is really important, um, hence the um, dependence on testosterone for growth. But once you shut off um, uh, androgen receptor signaling, you tend to turn on growth pathways such as um, PI3 kinase uh, slash the AKT pathway and so you get crosstalk between the pathways and as you inhibit one you you oftentimes get activation of another so that's kind of the rationale um, for for targeting that pathway um, but so far the benefits been somewhat modest and the side effects are relatively significant with those treatments so there's still a big refinement in how to uh, maximally use those th those treatments um, some other strategies that are particularly being marketed around um, the news are PSMA targeted imaging um, and therapeutic agents. So as I mentioned, prostate specific membrane antigen is a glycoprotein expressed highly on particularly higher um, Gleason or grade group um, score prostate cancers. Um, and you can use that for the PET scans. Um, so we're picking up a lot more um, disease than we could previously with our conventional imaging. Um, and this is opening up to potentially using some oligometastatic strategies for prostate cancer. Um, so really directing treatments aggressively towards um, just a few metastases, um, whereas previously they would have, um, you wouldn't have picked up those um, small metastases. And by the time you did pick up things, the disease was generally too far in advance to really focus on that. And you really needed to go with systemic treatment. We're still really refining those strategies though, and, and there's still a lot of question marks there, but having these um, you know, more sensitive scans is allowing some exploration of that space. Um, but where people are really excited with the PSMA targeting um, agents is really in the therapeutic space um, because you can ligand instead of uh, uh, you know something like gallium for PET imaging, you can ligand a therapeutic um, molecule to the PSMA and then it goes around and um, you know uh, binds to the PSMA receptor on the cancer cells, gets internalized and can deliver that therapeutic moiety to um, the cancer cell in a much more targeted fashion. Um, and with that, um, uh, there's a lot of excitement around that, particularly lutetium PSMA therapies. And then I put a question mark for immunotherapy. So far, immunotherapy, the benefits are probably restricted to a very small subgroup and our strategies for picking the winners in that respect are still pretty poor. Um, so that's still a place where there's a lot of room for improvement, a lot of exploration, and it's not, we can't access those treatments off of a clinical trial in Australia. They're very expensive and they're, the evidence behind them so far is still a work in progress. So I thought I'd run us through a case study kind of hitting on some of these key points um, uh, for uh, metastatic prostate cancer um, that I've mentioned to put them into some context, um, particularly in clinical practice. So this case study is a 65-year-old gentleman. He presents with lower urinary tract symptoms and a PSA of 56, and he undergoes a prostate biopsy, which shows a Gleason score of four plus three, which correlates to an ISEP grade group of three. Um, and here I've just got a diagram of, um, you know, the the H and E slide of the different grade groups and, and how they correlate to the Gleason score. So grade group five is really the um, old Gleason um, nines and tens. So four plus five, five plus four, five plus five, and grade group four is the old Gleason four plus four. Um, but basically, what you see are the well-formed glands become increasingly chaotic and uh, less structured. So this guy has a, um, a, a middle grade um, a prostate tumor, so, but he has a relatively high PSA, so he undergoes um, staging. Um, and this gentleman, um, it's not funded in Australia for this purpose, but um, he went on to a clinical trial to look at a PSMA PET scan um, of his disease, and he was found to have quite extensive disease on this PSMA PET scan. So PSMA is um, uh, expressed on the salivary glands, and so that's normal. You do get a little bit of background liver uptake. Um, uh, there is some expression in the kidneys, but also the um, uh, isotope is excreted through the kidneys, so you often see the bladders and the kidneys um, showing up. So that's all normal distribution and a little bit in the spleen and a little bit in the bowel, but everything else you see that's quite dark um, here, that's all cancer. So he's got really extensive 
um, disease on this PSMA PET scan. And just to put this into context, when you look at the traditional FDG PET scan, because that was part of this guy's clinical trial, was looking at um, matched um, PET scans, um, he, you really don't see nearly as much disease on the FDG PET scan. So whereas PSMA PET is quite specific for prostate cancer, FDG PET, it's really kind of the more de-differentiated, um, uh, oftentimes heavily pretreated cancers that a lot of times show up. So you don't necessarily get good uptake or a good sense of what the disease is off an FDG PET. And a real easy way to tell the difference between an FDG and a PSMA PET scan is um, the brain does not express PSMA, so you're going to have a cold brain on that on a PSMA PET, and um, obviously the brain uses a lot of glucose, so you're going to have a lot of uptake on an FDG PET scan. Um, so, uh, this gentleman, he has a PSA of 56, he's got extensive disease on his PSMA PET scan, and um, he's got confirmed prostate adenocarcinoma on his prostate biopsy. So, in light of these results, what's the best line of treatment? So, ADT alone, ADT plus docetaxel, um, ADT plus abiraterone, um, ADT plus enzalutamide or apalutamide, or any of the above. So, I'll give you just a few seconds to think about that. Um, so this guy has hormone sensitive metastatic prostate cancer. So if we give him ADT, his PSA is going to go down. Um, and so um, in light of his result with extensive um, uh, met metastases on his PET scan, preferably you're going to give him androgen deprivation therapy with an LHRH agent. Um, plus or minus either docetaxel or an androgen signaling inhibitor like abiraterone or enzalutamide. Um, so um, ADT would definitely bring down his PSA without a doubt. I mean, it's highly effective, but um, the studies have really shown that to improve um, disease control in the longer term um, and certainly um, overall survival, adding an additional agent um, is going to be beneficial. Um, so what, what's the basis of this? So as I mentioned, the charted study is the real study that we look at, and this is this Kaplan-Meier curve for survival. Um, and we had um, a more than 10 months improvement in median overall survival and a 28% reduction uh, uh, the hazard ratio for uh, death um, in the overall group. But when you really tease it out, um, when you look at disease volume, you see that actually there's not probably a, there's not really a difference um, for the low volume disease. But in the men with higher volume disease, which was defined as four or more metastases, um, bone metastases, with at least one beyond the axial skeleton or visceral metastases of any number, um, uh, you really start to see a separation of the curve with the ADT plus the chemotherapy. And you can see there's more than a 15-month improvement in median overall survival in these men. Um, there was another study, um, the Stampede study, which has multiple arms, and one of the arms did have docetaxel, and they didn't really find this separation based on volume, but around Australia you'll find a lot of clinicians really do um, reserve the combination with docetaxel for patients with, with at least a few metastases, if not heavier burden of disease. Um, and again, um, abiraterone, the study for that, uh, one of the studies was latitude, and also the stampede had an arm with abiraterone, um, so it was ADT plus or minus abiraterone, um, and the ADT was the clinician's choice of any LHRH agent that they wanted to use. And again, the median overall survivals are pretty similar, um, and these men needed at least um, two metastases or visceral metastases. Um, so you're seeing that really big separation in the survival curves um, and quite significant p-values with these treatments and so that's why we're keen to give these treatments up front. Um, for abiraterone we're not as fussed as it being a heavy disease and um, both stampede and latitude um, really showed a benefit kind of regardless of the volume of disease but unfortunately again we can't access those treatments except for on a cost sharing program which is still quite costly for the patient. So the reality is um, generally in um, Australia, we wouldn't have done a PSMA PET scan on this guy because um, he would have had to pay um, five to $700 for that. Um, and so he actually got conventional imaging because that is, the that is what 
um, the basis of the volume of disease in these trials that I just mentioned was all on conventional imaging. So the patients were delineated high or low volume based on CT and bone scan. So he actually has a CT and a bone scan that shows that he's got three bony metastases. So by charted criteria, he'd actually have low volume disease, um, but bordering onto the high volume. Um, so in light of this information, he's got, you know, low to moderate volume disease, hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Would it be reasonable to um, do a radical prostatectomy in this gentleman? Uh, be radiate his primary um, tumor in the prostate, radiate all his metastases, so the three bone metastases you see on bone scan plus his prostate, or give some ADT and consider radiation to his prostate. And so, um, what we recommended for this gentleman uh, is um, D, um, giving androgen deprivation therapy and considering radiation to his prostate. Um, and that's really based on um, evidence from a few different studies um, showing that in men with low volume disease, um, e, low metastatic burden, um, giving radiation to the primary can improve not only um, uh, progression-free survival, but also um, overall survival. And that's probably because it makes sense that, you know, if you're debulking a, a, a good proportion of their disease and getting good local control, then you're giving benefit. Whereas if it's, you know, maybe one to two percent of their overall disease, if they've got extensive um, metastatic um, uh, disease, then you're probably not making a, bit, a big different impact on their disease state. And these are the survival curves showing, and the um, failure-free survival curves showing that in low volume the curves separate, whereas there's um, you know overlap for um, high metastatic um, uh, burden of disease. So um, in Australia, we would consider giving um, a radiotherapy to the primary in addition to systemic treatment, so um, at least androgen deprivation therapy, um, but it doesn't need to be done at any particular time. A lot of times we try to do it within the first year of treatment. Um, we see that the AD, uh, the PSA is falling and they're responding to treatment and um, then we kind of get them to see the radiation oncologist in that setting. This patient, there was a discussion about docetaxel, but he preferred um, not to have chemotherapy um, and actually opted to self fund abiraterone in combination with prednisone as per the stampede and the latitude studies. Um, so he had androgen deprivation therapy with, um, with abiraterone um, and would have been sent off to see the radiation oncologist about um, treatment to his primary. Um, so the side effects he could expect with the addition of abiraterone um, and low dose prednisone to his treatment would include or would not include um, either A, hypertension, B, easy bruising, C, hypokalemia, D, peripheral edema, or E, obstructive LFTs. So all of these are side effects of abiraterone uh, with low-dose prednisone, except um, E, the obstructive LFTs. Um, so abiraterone can occasionally cause more of a hepatitic inflammatory LFT picture, which is very rare, but otherwise it causes a CONS-like syndrome based on its um, uh, mechanism of action. It's a CYP17 inhibitor, so it really focuses on the adrenal um, uh, androgens uh, that can be produced um, despite the um, LHRH um, turning off testicular production of testosterone, and so the side effects are based on some of the shunting of that. Um, adrenal uh, steroid pathway. So hypertension generally preferentially treated with an ACE inhibitor but treated as per usual hypertension. Easy bruising is oftentimes due to the prednisone, hypokalemia, and uh, peripheral edema is that cons like syndrome. Um, and we do generally do some LFTs in the first kind of month that the patient's on abiraterone to make sure they don't have a hepatitic picture but that's very rare. Um, so this patient will be on um, long-term androgen deprivation therapy. So ADT with an LHRH agonist for metastatic disease is an ongoing thing. Any treatment we we start on a patient um, is in addition to the ADT. So essentially most of the men with metastatic prostate cancer will be on ADT in the long term. Um, uh, so he's now on um, long term ADT. His testosterone will be low in the long term. So bone health and cardiovascular risk management become really important. Um, so in this setting, 
what advice would you give him? Um, so advise him to take regular vitamin D and or calcium. Um, prescribe Exgiva 120 milligrams Q4 weekly for his bone health. Um, ask his treating oncologist or urologist to use Degarelix, um, an LHRH antagonist rather than an LHRH agonist such as Lucrin or Zolodex, um, or monitor his bone density at appropriate intervals. Um, and really, you would ask him, uh, you would do um, three of the four of these things. Um, so um, I always have a discussion when starting long-term ADT of the importance of um, taking vitamin D, um, weight-bearing exercise. I have a discussion with them about their calcium, dietary calcium intake, and if it's um, not adequate, then I ask them to supplement with calcium. Um, uh, depending on his cardiovascular risk factors, Degarelix might be the preferred option. There's a very modest difference in the increase of cardiovascular risk um, with uh, Degarelix versus an LHRH agonist. That's pretty modest, so generally I'll weigh up their baseline uh, risk factors. And um, uh, and the pros and the cons of having a monthly form formulation of the Degarelix versus the potential for a three or six monthly formulation with the Lucrin or Zolodex or Eligards or whatnot. <coughs> um, and also, Degarelix can have a bit more of a local um, reaction, and sometimes patients just really don't tolerate it when they're having a big erythematous reaction uh, for a week out of every four weeks um, uh, of their injection cycle. Um, but um, there definitely is a consideration for which agent you'll use depending on cardiovascular risk factors. Um, and certainly I get a baseline bone density and, and monitor every one to two years thereafter. Um, Exgiva is really for castrate resistant um, prostate cancer with extensive bone metastases. At that dose, you would generally use the 120 milligrams Q4 weekly. Um, there's a lot of studies looking at de-escalating that, however, um, but for um, if he was osteoporotic, you'd be looking at using prolia, um, you know, six monthly at the usual osteoporosis dose. So for bone health, that's not the um, recommended formulation um, dose or frequency. So this patient is happy, things are going so well, but he's worried about his future generations. So when it comes to genetic testing, what, what should we tell him? Um, a, if there's no family history, there's no risk. Um, B, he should get tested for BRCA or BRCA-like mutations as there's about a 10% risk in metastatic prostate cancer for these um, germline alterations. C, BRCA2 is the most common familial inherited risk factor. Um, D, there are now drugs that target BRCA2 um, tumors called PARP inhibitors, or E, sometimes the tumors actually develop BRCA mutations, um, so um, somatic mutations. Um, so uh, for um, uh, genetic uh, genomic testing, um, I'll say that this is a fictional name. This is Mr. Rodriguez. It's not a not a real patient. So um, there's no patient confidentiality being broached here. It's kind of a more composite um, case. But um, uh, basically, you could tell him that um, B, C, D, and E are all um, correct. So independent of family history, um, men with metastatic prostate cancer have about a 10 percent risk, um, but certainly um, in localized disease um, or in more advanced disease, the more um, first degree relatives, and certainly depending on their age, the higher that risk can be. Um, so localized disease, you really think about what is their family risk and what is their risk um, before you consider testing, but in metastatic, um, the international guidelines actually um, oftentimes are suggesting that for metastatic, you should be doing testing regardless of the family history. Um, getting access to that is another story. This, of course, is not funded um, by Medicare. Um, BRCA2 is the most common um, uh, uh, issue that we do find. <coughs> um, uh, to a lesser extent, we see ATM and BRCA1 as far as CHECK2 and PALB2, um, among other genes. Um, and the PARP inhibitors are particularly working well in, it appears, uh, BRCA mutated tumors. Um, and certainly up to 30% of men um, with, with metastatic prostate cancer at some disease, at course state, uh, sorry, at some time in their disease course can develop um, somatic BRCA mutations. Um, so in that case, the PARP inhibitor still might work even if they don't have a germline mutation. So the germline genes associated with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, that's, so that's where you're seeing um, uh, um, 
a higher rate of um, uh, germline mutations, but really nearly half are BRCA2. We see a lot of ATM, BRCA1, CHECK2, and then we do see a little bit of mismatch repair um, gene defects, particularly in the Gleason 5. Um, uh, prostate cancer is not so much in the low grade, um, and then there's a few other kind of DNA repair um, uh, genes, but a lot of DNA repair pathway genes um, altered. Um, so future options for Mr. Rodriguez, um, so he remains on abiraterone for two years and then his um, disease begins to progress after that. So possible future treatments in Australia could include docetaxel, cabazitaxel, lutetium, PSMA, enzalutamide, PARP inhibitors, or radium-223. So um, these are the taxane chemotherapies that have proven overall survival benefit. Lutetium PSMA um, has just had a um, randomized phase two versus cabazitaxel um, presented at the recent ASCO conference, and that showed a PSA response rate of 64%, um, uh, so promising, but um, it wasn't powered for overall survival. Um, uh, enzalutamide, uh, which um, a firm and Prevail showed benefit for that in a castrate-resistant setting. PARP inhibitors, um, we've got studies for as well, um, uh, still, um, uh, later on in the disease course after a few different treatments, and radium-223, which has shown a survival benefit as well in bone predominant disease. Um, at this point, you can't routinely access um, F radium-223 in Australia. Um, there are a lot of, there's access to lutetium PSMA, but it, that's generally either on a clinical trial or self-funded. Um, and then the um, and PARP inhibitors would be the same, either on a clinical trial or self-funded, but docetaxel, cabazitaxel, and enzalutamide would be available on the PBS for this patient. So to sum up, um, hopefully I've given you a bit of an overarching view of kind of what's evolving in prostate cancer and a bit of a clinical context to that. Um, but the key points are that the paradigms for treating advanced prostate cancer are changing. So this old model of ADT, wait for resistance to that, and then string the long treatments beyond that um, uh, is changing. We're bringing treatments a lot earlier in the disease. We're refining our molecular targets and looking at more um, genomically uh, directed treatments. Um, there are emerging targeted treatments that are promising. So lutetium PSMA is showing a lot of promise, and it's nice because it's got limited toxicities involved with it, um, whereas um, uh, some of the other, you know, quote, targeted treatments that are targeted at DNA vulnerability, such as PARP inhibitors, they are associated with some toxicity. So just because it's a tablet, just because it's not chemotherapy, doesn't mean that it doesn't have significant side effects. Um, and then men are living longer um, and remaining on ADT throughout their disease course. Um, and so it's really important that they have a great um, uh, local doctor, um, general practitioner um, to help look after their cardiovascular metabolic mode and mental health. Um, uh, these are really important factors for these men. So, you know, I try to address them in consultations, but sometimes the patient is wondering why we're not talking specifically about their cancer. And, um, and sometimes when we're trying to switch treatments or whatnot, it does sometimes take a back seat in the discussion. Um, so, um, but they're as important, if not, you know, far more important for some of these men. So, you know, it's really great if we can work as a team to really look after the overall well-being of uh, the patient. And that's it. Thank you.